Welcome in to today's daily sports take. I hope everybody out there is having a wonderful day. Now, I'm not going to lie. I know during this quarantine and during these daily sports takes, the sports news cycle has, for the most part, been slow. But today, it's been even more slow than usual. I've been struggling to find a story. So I decided that I want to talk about the Last Dance documentary that's been airing on ESPN, parts 1 through 6. We still have to wait for parts 7 through 10 over the next two weeks. But spoiler alert, Last Dance documentary. We're going to talk about it right here. But if you missed any of my other daily sports takes, be sure to subscribe to my channel and check out my previous videos. So I wanted to go over three takeaways from the Last Dance documentary that I've noticed over these first six episodes. I've been watching them religiously every Sunday night, and it's been really intriguing. Even if we had a world of sports right now, I think the Last Dance documentary would still be as successful as it has already been. So one of my takeaways is the fact that Jerry Krause is seen as the quote-unquote villain in this series, but the real person we should be looking at is Jerry Reinsdorf, the owner of the Bulls. Now, yes, Jerry Krause has little man syndrome, and yes, he wanted to prove that his, himself and the organization were more successful than the players alone. But at the end of the day, when a general manager is trying to save money for the team, that's words coming from the owner's mouth. That's the owner not wanting to spend money. So when Jerry Krause isn't willing to pay Scottie Pippen more, it's because Jerry Reinsdorf even said in the documentary he was not going to give a new contract to a player if he hadn't fulfilled his previous contract yet. So that comes from Jerry Reinsdorf. And then when you talk about the team becoming too expensive, that's Jerry Krause going to Reinsdorf and being, hey, what, what do you want me to do with this team? And Jerry Reinsdorf saying, save as much money as possible. I want to make sure my profit margins are as big as possible. It's just sad that that happened because it had they held on to Phil Jackson and had they been able to spend the money like they wanted to, this could have been a team that went on to win eight, nine, maybe ten championships. That could be too far. The Kobe and Shaq Lakers were just two years later after this dynasty ended, but I do believe this team could have won a few more championships. So it's a shame there. And yes, Jerry Krause has small man syndrome, and yes, he was bullied by players and didn't like them, but it's not all his fault for the Bulls dynasty being broken up. No matter how much MJ and Phil want to say that, you have to look at Jerry Reinsdorf as well and put some blame on him for how this whole situation unfolded with the Chicago Bulls in the late 90s. Now my next takeaway is the fact that while many want to credit Greg Popovich or even Doc Rivers now for the term load management and actually load managing, Phil Jackson was actually the king of load managing. What other coach in any of the pro, any of the four professional sports leagues would have a player come up to him and say, hey coach, I know I've been the number two option the last couple weeks, but Scotty's back now. I'm back to being the number three. I need 48 hours to go to Vegas, get my mind right. I'm not that guy, and now I am mentally in a bad place. I need to step away. And for a coach in Phil Jackson to then go to his best player, Michael Jordan, tell him the situation, and Michael Jordan say, listen, if you let him go, we're probably not going to get him back for a while. It's going to be longer than 48 hours, I can tell you that. But then for Phil Jackson to still say, okay, Dennis, go do what you need to do. We'll see you back in 48 hours. And to allow Dennis Rodman to do that because he understands that that's going to be what's best for his team long term. They were on one last dance, as the documentary is called. He, Phil Jackson knew he was out after this year. He understood that they wanted to go out on a three-peat. Again, the second three-peat of the Jackson Michael Jordan era for the Chicago Bulls, but to allow him to do that in order to make sure that he is happy and that the team will be able to rebound was a really phenomenal coaching job. But the fact that we say today's players are softer because they want to load manage, it's been going on forever. It's extremely difficult for every player to be mentally locked in week in and week out, day in, day out, hour by hour in an NBA season. That's what separates the all-time greats, the goats of the game, from the rest of the NBA players, but for a coach to realize that and to allow him, especially in that time, you have to give Phil Jackson so much credit for what he was able to do as far as managing those Chicago Bulls teams. And then finally, my last takeaway is, while many of us talk about how the game has changed for the worse and it's become softer over the last few years, you have to realize that in the 80s and 90s, as we're seeing all these old highlights, the game was dominated by big men that didn't have that many skills. Their only skill set was the fact that they were born with a big body and they were able to just physically beat down every other player. 
that took away from younger generations of kids who wanted to just learn how to shoot the ball and they wanted to get better at dribbling. Well, now in the in the new NBA, it's about point guards. It's about shooting guards. It's about you could be six foot one like a Trey Young, but if you could dribble the crap out of the ball and you can shoot from long range and you can make defenders miss by weaving and bobbing, you have a chance to be a star. And that's become more relatable to the masses. And that's why the NBA has become more of a global game. Now, the 1992 Dream Team did make the game more global, but it wasn't because of the big men in the game. It was because of Michael Jordan. It was because of Scottie Pippen. It was because of guys like that that were more skilled that made the game grow so much. So while big men were the focus back then and they were able to dominate the game for longer stretches, I think this documentary shows that Jordan helped change the, the thinking a little bit from saying you have to be seven foot to be an all-time great to, okay, you don't have to be a physical menace, but if you develop skills with the ball and mentally, you could actually grow. And we've seen that expand twofold since the 2010s with Steph Curry and James Harden and Trey Young now and Luka Doncic and all those players who aren't the absolute biggest but have become more skillful than in the past. Not to say that centers have been useless nowadays, but if you're seven foot two, you can no longer just go in the paint and body everybody up. You're gonna have to learn how to shoot the ball. You're gonna have to learn how to dribble, how to pass out of the block. You have to be able to have those skills in order to make it in the NBA as a starter. So there you have it. There's some takeaways from the Last Dance documentary parts one through six. Let me know what you think of the documentary down below. So far, all the reviews seem to be really great on the documentary. The one complaint that many have, and I kind of see it sometimes, is the fact that it bounces back and forth between different time parts too quickly. I think they should finish storylines before they bounce back and forth, but that's really my only knock on the documentary. So with that, everybody, I'd really love it if you leave a like on this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. So the Last Dance documentary part 7 and 8 will happen this Sunday, and I'll be right back here with more sports takes every single day right on YouTube. Have a great day, everybody.